Hey, this is Jack Russell from Jack Russell's Great White, and you listen to Focus on Metal. Ha <laughs> ha. Hey, Metalhead, Scott Thompson here, welcoming you to yet another week of Focus on Metal. So before I go any further, just want to give a big shout out to our buddy Brian Heaton, frequent Focus on Metal contributor. And just because when the last episode came out, I think Brian probably hit me up with feedback within like an hour of it being up there. Always appreciate the great stuff Brian does for us. Hopefully have him back on the show again soon. And if you really want to know what's up in the world of Brian Heaton, then you should check out the great book that he co-authored called Building an Empire, the story of Queensryche. Or you can hit up his great site, anybodylistening.net. So this will be the first of two weeks of Richie sitting down and talking with Michael Lardy of Great White. And Richie has been chasing this one down for a while, and the occasion being that it is the uh, 30th anniversary of their release, Psycho City, which is the uh, their last studio release that they did with uh, Capital. So yep, for the next two weeks, Richie and Michael will be talking all things Great White uh, a lot about Michael's early career and, you know, of course, Psycho City. And as we were going through and mixing and editing this episode, I was thinking about it. And, you know, we've actually had quite a few people from Great White on the show over the years. Back in uh, 2017, episode 321, we had Jack Russell on. In uh, 2019, episode 420, we had Tony Montana and then uh, pretty much just recently, episode 493, back in uh, March of 2021, we had Mark Kendall on the show. And I guess if you really want to be a completist on Great White History, we can also reach back to uh, January of 2016, episode 267, where uh, we had guest Sean McNabb. Because, yeah, even Sean McNabb at one point back in the history of Great White was in the band. And, of course, all of those interviews can be found at FocusOnMetalPod.com, on Amazon Music, and, of course, on iTunes. So I'm thinking that's probably everybody from Great White we've had on the show at one time or another. But who knows? I could have missed somebody because they actually have gone through quite a few members in the uh, latter years of the band. So anyways, as I was saying, Richie's been tracking this one down for a while. He talked to me months ago, talking about trying to get a hold of Michael, and they were going back and forth and trying to get just the right time to do this. And uh, Richie finally was able to nail him down. They had a great chat, and as I said, we're going to be uh, rolling this out over the next two weeks. And also, like I said, the big subject that uh, you know we caused this whole meetup was the uh, September 1992 release of Psycho City. As I said, the last one that they did for uh, Capitol Records, at least the last studio album. You had Jack Russell on there, Mark Kendall, Michael Lardy, Audie Desbro on drums. And uh, they, at that point in time, no actual bassist in the band. And uh, Dave Spitz, Danny Spitz's brother, steps in and does bass for the album as well. And they have a couple of other extra people in there. But that is uh, pretty much the cast of characters. And the uh, album was actually produced by Alan Niven, who was their manager, as well as Michael Lardy. And, you know, that bit, lots of hopes on this one coming after Hooked. But this is definitely one, too. They talk about it where... And this seems to be a common theme. They decide that they're just going to go for it. And at this point, they're pretty sick of the label. And you can tell with some of the songs that they have on here as well that there's pretty much a lot of undercurrent of, uh, you know, hey, fuck you. But I will let Michael tell all about that and more as he talks to Richie about all things Great White, Michael Lardy, and Psycho City. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richie and Great White's Michael Lardy. Hi, is that Michael? Yeah, good morning. Is that Richie? It is. How you doing, Michael? Good. How you doing? I'm okay. So you're on the West Coast? 
on the west coast today and then uh heading out toward um manistee michigan uh this afternoon okay you got shows this weekend yeah, we got a show with Slaughter on Saturday, so we're traveling today. Okay. How much rehearsal do you guys do now for the show? Uh, it's not a bunch. We try to do it, you know, whenever we're trying to do maybe perhaps a major overhaul on the set and or we've been off for, um, you know, over, over a month and a half. That's kind of our bar. If we haven't played anywhere in six weeks, we kind of say we really should at least have one rehearsal. You know, mm. I think that that helps keep us sharp. Now, obviously, when we're, you're banging out two and three a week, you know, week after week, um, <laughs> by midsummer, you know, you're you're rolling and you're in monster mode. You know, you're definitely handling it. So yeah. <laughs> that's what we try to do. Yeah. How how easy is it, Michael, to get you guys together? To rehearse, or, or is there is there big distances between a lot of you? Not so bad. Um, two of us are in Vegas, two of us in LA, and one's in Florida. So it's kind of uh, you know, as far as getting the band together, we're all kind of on the on the west side. So when we pull in a rehearsal, we we, we try to you know think about when that's going to happen and, and do the planning for it. So it's not super difficult. Um, you know, so we we can we can still pull it off. I mean, unfortunately, it's not like we were 26 and all lived, you know, six blocks from each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I, it, it, all, it always fascinates me, the bands now that go out and do the fly-in shows, that in a lot of ways it's beneficial to them, you know, they can do what they need to do during the week and then go out and do the shows. But then on the other hand, it is difficult to rehearse because the only time you have together is actually playing the shows. Yeah, and uh, you know it's 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 a way of life that has changed touring, you know, pretty much forever for our genre of music. You know, because buses and fuel are just astronomical in terms of costs, and like you said, we get the opportunity to uh, be home for a couple of days a week and uh, have some assemblage of uh, handling our lives <laughs> instead of being out straight for seven months and 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 feeling like, oh, where do I live? <laughs> Has that ever happened to you over the years where you've no idea where you are when you wake up? That's never happened to me personally, but I can say that a couple of my bandmates have have, have said that. And, you know, other bands that occurs to all the time. One time I remember we were on tour with, um, we were the headliner and we had Bullet Boys and Steelheart opening up for us. And I think it was Steelheart's first major tour. And, 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 and poor Mike, he... Uh, he, he got on stage one night and said, Welcome, Ohio, Ohio, which is a, uh, an amalgam of, you know, it's a, it's a cross pollinization of Iowa and Ohio, which we had been <laughs> in two times that week. So, you know, it can, it can happen to us, you know, as, as far as recently, because like, there's so much planning involved in where you have to fly to and, you know, where you're going to be this, this day, uh, and the fact that there's not so many shows directly in a row, you have a far greater chance of not of ha- having that not occur. Mm. Michael, when is the last time you went to Europe to play? Uh, I'm trying to think. I want to say in 19, or was, it, or was it 17, we did a Monsters of Rock um, cruise that went out of um, Marseille. And went around the Mediterranean and ended up in Spain. I think that's the last time we went over to Europe. We were supposed to go and do Firefest, um, but then that mean old COVID came along and kind of threw a monkey wrench in that. So I know that they're uh, still got us in the uh, the hopper, you know, to uh, when he puts together that back together that festival again. We're you know at the, at the top of the heat there as far as you know the NC wants to to be out. Mm. Nice, nice. Well, the, one of the reasons I have you on is we're going to talk about the uh, the Psycho City record, which is 30 years old this year, if you can believe that. Um, hard, to, hard to imagine, but yeah. yes, um, 1992. <laughs> 92, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you play any of those songs in the set currently? We do. We're doing Big Goodbye, and uh, occasionally, you know, I've, I've been trying to um, get them to... Uh, look at uh 
working up Never Trust Your Pretty Face again because that's one of those ones that would be a great opener. It's so ballsy and so in your face, mm. you know. So it, it could be something, but uh, everybody seems amenable to the concept. So, uh, you know, perhaps uh, by the next time we get over there, get over to the, uh, the European side of life, um, we're uh, going to have an opportunity to play. And, and we always try to ma- make a little bit heavier set for Europe. Because I think they really appreciate, you know, that part of our catalog. Yeah. Do you think you know, do you think Europe got you guys a little bit earlier than the American audience did? That you know they've 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 stuck with you over the years. They're a little bit more you know, loyal. It, it's interesting. We had, uh, you know, before I was actually in the band, and and uh, it was uh, I think it was originally a Jack Mark. Um, Gary Hall and Laura Black, they went over and toured uh, the UK with um, Whitesnake before their big record, you know, their huge record. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that really kind of established them as a, as a band that people would want to see. And then uh, later when we had, you know, uh, great success in the States, when we went back over in 89 with Alice Cooper, and we were really appreciated at that point. And, you know, even even though we don't go that often, uh, we're very lucky that, uh, you know, there's a great number of fans that uh, that come in and, you know, and, and see the shows and, and are, are definitely excited about seeing us. So, you know, we're we're grateful that they have, uh, you know, not forgotten about us, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, that's always been my viewpoint on, you know, American audiences obviously are so incredibly fickle, as you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you accomplish something, you know, my experience over in Europe, uh, it's kind of, it kind of sticks with you for your life. You know, the, the, the fact that people are, are aware of what you've accomplished creatively in, in the States, it can be a little bit, what have you done this week? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Michael, I want to ask, I want to get into Psycho City with you. Um, but I, I have to ask you about the album before that hooked. Now, I've read Mark Mark doing in, in interviews that he said that he wasn't entirely happy with that album, that he felt that it was a little bit rushed. Is, is that something that you agree with? Well, you know, we're part of the machinery at that point. You know, we've just come off twice shy and sold nearly three million records. So you get to a point where you're, um, you know, you're, you're, you're getting pushed to put out the next piece of product. And, uh, you know, as far as being rushed, I mean, we started to write songs in late summer of 91 and didn't start recording, um, I think, until the end of September. Uh, and we spent uh, almost three months on the record. I think everybody, why it was feeling rushed is things were so heady at that time as far as the success we were experiencing that nobody really had a chance to take a breath, so to speak. Mm. I've heard that from a lot of musicians over the years that it was on the road in the studio, on the road in the studio. You never, you're never able to like taste the success that you had and savor it. Yeah, that's part of the machinery, you know. The the record companies. I mean, I know Don Henley was uh, had said that about uh, what was going on with the Eagles, you know, and Joe Walsh said that as well. He said, you know, it didn't matter if we put out if we burped or we farted, they just had to meet their corporate quarter, you know? So that, that, that happens to, you know, mega groups and it certainly happens to groups that have been successful on our level. Uh, it's the same thing. The record companies push, 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 push to, uh, to get new product out there. As far as the recording process, I didn't feel like it was rushed really at all. I mean, you know, we, um, we took our time to make sure, um, they're probably about half the record. We, looked at the basic tracks on it, you know, about half the record and said, no, nah, they're, they're, they don't have the right feel yet. So we went back and, and redid those. So that would be a lot more time we spent on that part of it than we ever had before. Mm. Um, yeah. So, you know, for me, I, I, you know, I came up being a musician and a studio guy. So to me, being there was like being home. So it never felt rushed to me. It's like, oh, another day in the studio? Cool. You know? <laughs> Michael, how did you end up being a producer in the band? I, I know you're an engineer, but was that something that you, you fought for, or did the, did the guys ask ask you to do it? 
it was kind of a very organic thing. I remember uh, when they came in to record shot the, the demos for Shot in the Dark, um, they were talking about wanting to expand their sound, you know, to have an, uh, an uh, you know an extra guitar player and uh, keyboards and some of the, the music and. Um, you know, they had the idea, so, you know, I just happened to be working at the studio they recorded at, and I said, oh, I, I, can, I can come up with some parts for you, you know, I can, I can do that, let's, let's check it out, you know, and, um, you know, played the parts on, on the records, and uh, before you knew it, I was playing with them live, and then the band got re-signed to Capitol after losing their original deal with EMI in, uh, I think it was 83, they lost the deal. Or late or early eighty four, and the band got re-signed by Capitol in eighty six. It was at that point that they were going and visiting all kinds of producers. They were talking to Tom Werman. They were talking to Ken Scott. You know, they're talking to um, the guy um, Michael James Jackson. I think his name was. Um, you know, a lot of different guys, and and you know, everybody felt that they weren't really getting what we were about and what we were trying to do. So. The band's manager uh, at the time, Alan Niven, uh, came to me and said, is there any reason you can think that you and I couldn't do the, these records? And I said, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we know what we want. We would know what we'd like it to sound like. And, and you know, I, being an engineer, I have the ability to, you know, uh, convey my thoughts and you convey your thoughts and I can, you know, uh, absorb them and, and, and make them happen. So it was a very organic thing. It just, it just kind of came up in conversation like that. So Capital didn't quite know what to do with us at that point. They had just resigned us. So they kind of left us in a very autonomous situation, which was great. We recorded at the beach, which was about 30 miles away from Hollywood, which the joke was it's harder to get a record exec 30 miles away to the beach than it would be to get on a plane and fly to New York. So we were left to our own devices pretty much. And we and with Once Bitten, the album, we had a chance to really develop where we thought we sh were our best, you know, and that certainly was, you know, Mark's um, blues guitar playing, which oddly enough, when we were working on... Uh, I was actually an assistant engineer um, at, and a staffer at the place they recorded the very, very first album, the Black Album. And uh, I was hearing Mark warm up between takes on these uh, on these songs that were, you know, reminiscent of, you know, Judas Priest and Van Halen. The band, I, to me, it sounded like that at that time. And but I would hear him play the blues and. And I would sit and talk to him and, and talk about our love of Johnny Winter and Alvin Lee and all those guys. And, and, and I was just thinking, you know, when I'd watch Mark play that stuff, I felt like, you know, his soul was escaping his body. You know, like he was showing me something that he felt really connected with, you know. So I thought to myself, that's what this cat should be playing, man. That's, that's where he shines, mm -hmm. you know. And it just was a bit, like I said, it was a very organic thing. We got together and we're starting to write songs. And, and it was just one of those things that, you know, it was a, the right combination of people and time and circumstance uh, to, to allow us the opportunity to develop our sound. Yeah. Now, you and Alan produced the records, but I'm, I'm curious to know, what did he do as a producer that you didn't do, and vice versa? How did you break, break, break all that up? I think Alan was probably more about arrangement of songs. You know, that was one of his fortes. You know, he was he was good at that for the the blues format that we were doing. Um, you know, as far as as far as you know, breaking down like what kind of part we should sing for a background part, or you know what extra guitar part should go on or what the sound of the keyboard was, you know, that was kind of more my thing. But, you know, as far as writing, writing the songs, you know, Alan was, you know, uh, wrote a lot of the lyrics, you know, in, in those, um, earlier albums. So, you know, he felt connected to the music. So, you know, in, in, in many ways it was, you know, two brains working toward one goal. So it was, it was, it was again, very organic, you know, we were able to, to make that happen. Mm. Was it easy for you to produce a band that you're in? Because 
you have to be critical of a band member's performance, and sometimes they might not take it very well. Uh, I think that I always tried to be honest with them from the very beginning when we, when I was working with them, you know, as a staff engineer, you know, they would ask, you know, just, just as a guy they knew was a musician and also happened to be an engineer and they would ask me my opinion and I, you know, I would, I would tell them, I'd always be straight with them. I, you know, it was never my intention to, to be, um, you know, uh, spiteful or cruel or mean, you know, um, just to be honest and, and, and forthright with, with my, you know, uh, opinion of what was going on at the time. And I think of all the people I was hardest was upon myself. You yeah. know, I spent many hours in the studio by myself working out parts, uh, trying, you know, uh, 40, 50 different things as to not take away the time that, I was going to get the best out of Mark or the best out of Jack during the day or the evening. Uh, so I relegated, you know, the time I had for experimentation, you know, late at night. Um, and it worked out well. I mean, you know, playing around with the idea I had for the harmonica on Rock Me, that was, you know, not anything I was going to make anybody sit through while I was working it out. And then the next morning they came in and the joke got to be, all right, what did you get up to last night? You know, <laughs> so, you know, it was a lot of fun for me to be able to, to be there and be present for them as the, the producer engineer guy during the day and the evening when Mark and Jack were, you know, it was important to be, you know, close with them and, and, and be supportive of them. And then at night I could, you know, play around and it was a really cool combination of things. You know, it, it was, a. Uh, we were able to do most of our records in about 45 days, including mastering. So you're talking recording, mixing, and mastering in 45 days, which was pretty swift for for a lot of bands of that time, you know. And we were spending probably 40% of what most bands were spending on records, which certainly made our record company happy. I was actually going to ask you that, Michael, that... The record company would have been happy because they weren't hiring a Bob Rock or a Tom Werman that, that it was being kept in house. Yeah, but the funny thing is, I think a lot of people don't realize about uh, about that they 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 pay the money, but of course they get the money from record sales from Note One. When we have to pay back a producer, or we have to pay back a studio, or we have to pay back this or that, it comes out of our royalty rate. So for every dollar we spent on a studio, say $100,000, we could only pay back 13% from every record we sold. You know, so it took a quite a long time. Yeah. So, you know, record companies were kind of like the bank, you know, they, they put the money forth and then we were, you know, um, you know, able to, to pay back at the rate we were able to pay back and they got their money back, the 87% straight off from every record from the very first record. So, you know, it, it took a, it, it took a while every time to, to pay back, but certainly not as long as it took for a two hundred fifty three hundred thousand dollars recording budget, you know, four videos that cost, you know, 300000 apiece, you know, um, you know, we, we did everything, you know, economically uh, because we were a band that was really about, you know, the music and, and our image was just that we were, you know, just straightforward blues rockers, you know, mm. and it, 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 it made a difference from us being able to see, you know, income from, uh, from our records faster than most bands. Mm. Did you have a good relationship with Alan Niven? Yeah, I think that there was, you know, during the time that we were um, working together, I think that it, it, it worked out well. I mean, we were, we were close and, you know, of like mind and, you know, and as we tr tried to, um, you know, later in our career, as we tried to stretch out and try different things, um, you know, obviously, you know, a, a one person might not see it that way. And it got to a point where, you know, it was becoming more of, two camps, you know, uh, management, co-producer versus, uh, you know, saw things one way and the band saw things another way. So, you know, there's a shelf life, I think, of any relationship in music, especially, you know, where you get to a point where you realize, okay, we got some great stuff and we did some great things, but it's time to try something different. And, and that's, I, to me, that's part of the creative process. Mm. Now, of course, Tony Montana left 
after you did the Hooked album. Um, and you would have been in the studio a lot with him doing that record. And I don't know how much you were with him on the tour, personally, but when did you get a sense that he wasn't happy in the band, and, and were you surprised that he left? I think it was starting to get toward the end of the Hook tour, uh, and then uh, on um, rehearsals for Psycho City, where we were actually writing the tunes, um, he wasn't very present at that time, and I don't think he was particularly happy with... Uh, you know, his role in the band. He was actually a very good guitar player, and uh, I think he was young and took the gig as, as a bass player and realized after about four and a half, five years that, oh, this is the way my life is going to be going. I'm still young enough. I think I want to try something different. And um, that's just, you know, what we did. We ended up using uh, Dave Spitz on the recording, um, Danny Spitz's brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, fantastic bass player great new yorker guy great personality huge you know huge personality uh and i thought he did some great stuff on psycho city yeah now when you finished the hook tour um like the hooked album was released in february 91 and, and you brought out psycho city in september 92 that's a pretty quick turnaround so was the plan always to do a record the following year what, what circumstances came up came about to get get it done that quickly I think one of the biggest things is during the transition of after, just right after Twice Shy and into Hooked, uh, the company had changed presidents uh, from Don Zimmerman to Hale Milgram, who used to be at Electra. And Hale came in and had a different set of priorities as far as the artists that he wanted to push. So we pretty much told the company, all this uh, heavy metal, hard rock, um, I don't so much care about, but you got to spend all your energy on Bonnie Raitt and, you know, bands like, and, 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 you know, he, he basically pushed her to get her to a point where she became, you know, huge. So we kind of felt like they weren't in love with us anymore at that point, you know, as far as the record company was concerned. So I think with the little amount of, of input they gave to and work they gave to promoting Hooked, um, to us was disappointing so we wanted to get one more record before we left the left the um the company uh out uh and we i i felt like we were at a point where we were very confident in terms of our writing and felt like we were very you know we we had something to say we were a little disillusioned from you know how they how they treated us at a point uh and then how on a dime that can change so quickly um, so I think there is a, there is an edge to Psycho City that, that uh, is is prevalent throughout in, in in terms of disillusionment with with business and in life too. I mean, our relationships were you know a little bit uh, tortured, you know, in our personal life at that point. So you know, that's where I think the the inspiration for a lot of Psycho City came from. Mm. Michael, looking back on a note. Do you think you handle success well yourself? That you, pro- you would have had all these things thrown at you. You probably would have been g- getting these pretty big checks at the time. Were you, were you okay with all of that? I think I did okay with it. I think if, if I had to look back and have any regrets about uh, any of it is that I was always so self-possessed about working and what the next thing was going to be, what was the next accomplishment, that I unlike my band members, didn't take enough time to really kind of enjoy the, the, the success. Um, you know, but that's what worked for me. It would it, it would have been nice had I been able to take a breath like we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I was so possessed about, you know, what, uh, what could be better, uh, how we could do it better, what could be a better song that we wrote, what could be a new sound we could try, a new instrument I could try. On, on the records um, but I you know I, I was always a workaholic ever since I was a young kid you know I just started working in the in uh, in clubs and such when when I was uh, 14 15 years old I was already out uh, working with bands at nightclubs you know I, I had to sit outside on breaks but uh, you know that you know what, what do they say if you find something you love, you're lucky enough to never work a day in your life. And that's that's what I feel like my life has been. Okay. The first big check you got, 
from Great White. Uh, can you remember what you spent it on? Uh, Audie and I, the drummer, bought a condo. I remember that. And uh, and then after a, a year, I bought him out so he could move in and buy a house and, and move in with his girlfriend. But I think that was the, 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 the first big thing I remember that, you know, $25,000 down, you know, down. <laughs> On a, on a property, <laughs> a place to live. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have to rent anymore. Yeah. So back then, around the time of Psycho City, who, who was your best friend in the band? Oh uh, gosh, I think, you know, it really had to be pretty much everybody. I, I, I was so close with with everyone. I mean, we, we recorded it at a residence. We, we pulled up a mobile truck and uh, we lived together so it was like we were having breakfast and lunch together every day and you know living there and you know just rehearsals you know everybody was was present and you know it was just a lot of fun to 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 be that immersed in in what we were doing Mm. all right so we're gonna chop that one off for the week right there you know part of this with the longer episodes and the shorter ones is that uh you know i've been doing a lot of watching youtube lately rather than watching regular tv or netflix or anything and I've been kind of mixing it up the same way. It seems to be a more satisfying experience when I'm watching, you know, a two-hour rock documentary, and then I go to a shorter, like, 30-minute thing from, let's say, JHS Pedals or something. And uh, so I'm trying that out for Focus on Metal as well, give you some long ones and then some kind of short, bite-sized ones as well. So that's what we're doing with this one is kind of chopping Michael two bite-sized pieces for you. And, uh, hey, you know, we'll see how it works out. But like I said, there'll be uh, the second half of this will hit you for next week. But before we get out of here, I just want to uh, just let you know, you, you, you may know this already because it's been, uh, was announced, uh, I don't know, probably about a week ago. But uh, they do have the uh, Holy Diver Super Deluxe Edition that is coming out in July that uh, looks really cool. Obviously, I am a physical media whore, so I am all over this. But there's a four CD deal, which has got uh, CD one is the the brand new 2022 Joe Barisi mix of the album. CD two is a remaster, just done regular of the album. CD three is live at the Selland Arena in '83. CD four is uh, outtakes, singles, and B sides. So there's things on there like uh, an early mix of Evil Eyes in there and a couple of things of Rainbow in the Dark and some other stuff in there as well. This looks pretty cool. I'm definitely going to be getting that one. And then also, if that is not enough, and I'm, I've been looking around the day I'm mixing this, I've been looking. I still don't see it available yet, but they also are going to have a two-disc clear vinyl pressing of this with uh, side one has got the first four songs off the album side two of the first one has got the uh, don't talk to strangers straight through the heart and invisible on side uh, three which is you know lp2 side one you got uh, rainbow in the dark and shame on the night and also the bonus track of uh, evil eyes on here which was a bonus b-side of holy diver when this originally came out back in 83 and then side four Four, which is uh, you know LP two side two, is actually going to have an etching on it, and those always look really cool as well. I've had a Doro release that is on white vinyl, in which the fourth side has got an etched Doro logo. Looks pretty cool. So uh, I know that at least the four CD edition, I saw that on pre-order available at Amazon. I haven't really seen it anywhere. I lie. I've seen it on Rhino as well. And uh, like I said, as I'm mixing this tonight, I still don't see this available anywhere else. But this is supposed to come out on July 8th, which is uh, to tie in with the celebration of what would have been Ronnie's 80th birthday on uh, July 10th. So, yep, Ronnie and I, uh, birthday date wise, only a couple of days apart. More than a couple of years apart. So there you go. I've always get psyched when I uh, see new Ronnie stuff out. And, you know, part of that, too, is that uh, I've been reading Martin Popoff's great new book or kind of, I guess, a rebook in a way. Dream Evil Dio in the 80s. Awesome book. So I was already psyched when this announcement came out. 
And, uh, you know, again, it's Dio. It's one of those ones. I just have to get it. So for this week, that's it. There ain't no more. Stick a fork in it. This puppy is done. So for Richie, myself, and everybody else here at Focus on Metal, have yourselves a great metal week. And until we talk to you again next week, as always, remember. Focus on Metal. Everything else is insignificant. Still here? It's over. Go home.